Hello, everyone, and welcome to our year-round screening series, Now Virtual, Film Independent Presents. I'm Brian Sheehan, our Senior Manager of Industry Relations. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our loyal supporters. We have our lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, our screening partner, Vision Media, and our media partner, the Los Angeles Times. Today, uh, you'll be experiencing the amazing His House, now on Netflix. And uh, we have a special guest moderator today, Variety's Janelle Riley. Uh, without further ado, I will let Janelle take it from here. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you all for joining this film independent Zoom Live with the creative minds behind one of my favorite movies of the year, His House. At this time, please join me in welcoming writer-director Remy Weeks and actors Shape Dirisu and Wumi Musaku. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Um, I've made no secret of how much I love this movie. I, I'm so <laughs> thankful for all the nightmares you've given me. <laughs> um, uh, but I do like to start at the beginning, which is essentially by asking, what was your first job in the industry? The first time you felt you could call yourself a oh. professional actor or a writer director? <laughs> My mind flashed back to being the star in the Nativity play before you said the word professional. No, so that's like, yeah, that was my first ever performance. <laughs> <laughs> Who um, did you play? Uh, well, actually, it's a funny story because I was supposed to be the star, you know, that led the three wise men to Bethlehem, but uh, I had appendicitis, so I wasn't actually able to go on and perform my role. No. <laughs> yeah, but I did all the rehearsals oh, no. and stuff. I felt a part of the project, but I wasn't actually seen in it. <laughs> Um, but my first professional credit would have been my first day on set was for The Mill, which was a Dallas Smithson production on Channel 4 back in 2014 over here in the UK. Oh, wow. Wumi, for you? Um, my first job out of drama school was um, the Great Theatre of the World at the Arcola Theatre. And I was directed by actually one of my teachers at drama school, Bill Gaskell. So I don't know if that was kind of a cheat because he already <laughs> <laughs> knew me and I didn't have to audition. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I would say that was my first one um, uh, professionally, yeah. And oh, actually, to... I, did, oh, no. I did a play when I was nine, um, Wind in the Willows. Um, I wouldn't say I was a child actor, but I was. I did two weeks on at um, Manchester Palace Theatre when I was nine, and that was the best time ever. <laughs> Who did you play? I played a boy rabbit because I was too tall for the girls' um, <laughs> costumes, and I played a duck. And my line was, "Who puts the lid back on your toothpaste?" <laughs> to Ratty. <laughs> oh wow! Well, good memory. <laughs> Remy, what about for you? It was probably um, a music video I did during uni. I was probably at 20. It was like a UK rapper called Shiesty. Um And uh, I think you have to be of my generation in London to know who she is. But I did this music video, which wasn't the best, but I did it. And what was the track? It. it was called New Style. You wouldn't you remember. Right now. No. <laughs> oh. Everyone look oh. up. Oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> please. please don't. Actually, I want to remind everyone watching at home, if you have a question, uh, we'll get to the Q&A section a little bit later, but there should be a Q&A um, button in the bottom of the screen. Feel free to submit questions there for, uh, for the artists. Um, but I do want to start at the beginning with Remy. Um, this is a genuinely terrifying movie, but it's also uses real life horrors to tell its story. Um, how did this idea develop and what made you want to tell this story through the, uh, the genre of a thriller or suspense? Um, so it, the, the, the concept actually didn't start with me. I was part of a directing duo called Tell No One. And the offices that we went to for work we were signed to a production company. They shared office space with two producers, um, feature film producers. And so every time I went to work, I'd always see them and we always talk about um, my one day dream of making a feature film. And they, they said that they had this project they were developing. They wanted to make a horror film based on the immigrant experience, but the writers that were working with at the moment, it wasn't quite connecting. And so they asked me to pitch them my take. And so I went away and I came back to them with, I guess, my version of the story, which is, I guess, a very, um, a very intimate psychological 
story about two people trying to, I guess, survive after surviving mm -hmm. and moving forward with their life. And I understand you're the son of immigrants. Did you draw on any of their experiences or talk to them about uh, the film? So, um, well, my family's from St. Lucia, Sierra Leone and Wales. So I actually have family from multiple different places, but it wasn't really just them. It was more um, growing up. And I think, I, I, you know, I'm from a very a multicultural part of London and we're always talking about how to assimilate or if, whether we even should assimilate. And mm. I really wanted to tell that story of how, I guess, how much of yourself you're willing to let go to move through, move on in a, I guess, in a culture that could be quite, um, I guess, at best indifferent, at worst, quite co co corrosive in terms of letting others in. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the actors, how did the script find its way to you? And, and what were sort of your reactions upon reading it? I don't know if you got to read it all up front or you know, sometimes with uh, these situations, you're only given a log line and maybe a page. <laughs> um, but what were sort of your initial reactions? For me? Sure. Um, I, I, just, I just fell in love with the script. It just made so much sense to me that it would be um, done as a horror. And I was, it was like, of course it is because your heart's pounding and um, you feel a, a slight, you, you feel a percentage of what, and the, of the terror immigrants feel as they embark upon this journey, this horrific and, and you know, such a, you know, it's such a, it's just so dangerous. And it's, you know, the lucky people who arrive safely, they're still so traumatized and they still have so many scars and wounds gaping and, and I guess, um, uh, metaphorically. And so it just made sense to me. And I, I don't know, I would always say to um, Remy, um, is the, is the, a pet, is the beast, is the, is the, the haunted house is actually even real because I read that script not really knowing if it was and um I, it was just so clever it was just so clever to me because yes it is a horror film and it, you know Remy would always say no it is real <laughs> and you have to perform like it is real but you could take the actual embodied a pest and out and it's still completely works um completely mm. um so yeah I read it and you know I kind of got two-thirds of the way through and I had to like I literally threw the script down I was like to my husband no uh-uh let me go back I was just like I have to go back and read knowing this about you know the the big twist in the middle I as knowing that about them I had to go back and I was yeah. like wow every every line read completely differently knowing that um and it was just I just thought it was genius so when I got the script to, and, I, and I had to audition for it I was just like please give me the job <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> Shape for you yeah for me um I suppose I became aware of the project slightly differently I mean, what would happen normally is that we'd be sent scripts for our, by our representation and we read them and whether or not we connect with them. But I, I wasn't sent this script for a really long time. I had all of my friends, I'd be like, oh, have you read this script for? Are you going in for this? I was like, no, I'm not. Like, I didn't know. You know, sometimes you have uh, scheduling conflicts and if you're not available, then they won't even like, they'll availability check you before they sent you a script. And I was like, am I, am I busy? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not working. Why, um, why did they not want to see me for this job? And I remember a friend of mine even sent me his self-tape, just like, what do you think of the self-tape? I was like, yeah, I think the script is amazing and I still have not auditioned for it yet. <laughs> so, um, and then finally I was asked if I wanted to come in and uh, read for it. And yeah, like Wumi said, as soon as I read those sides, as soon as I read the script, I was like, I, I, this is a project that I connect with so much for so many different reasons. Not only is it um, a beautiful retelling of the horrors of the immigrant experience, but there were a lot of really interesting like nuances of the character of Bol that I, I wanted to sort of 
exercise and interrogate in my own life as well as in the characters. So I'm super grateful to Remy and the whole team for uh, allowing me to play with them on this. Remy, I, I'm, I'm so impressed that when Wumi asked you, you know, is, is the beast real? You instantly were like, yeah, because a lot of directors would say, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I love that you were decisive about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like when you're making a story scary, you have to believe it's real. I, was, I don't think the audience goes along with you. And I think it's that's the same for any kind of... Um, any kind of thing when it comes to the mind or mental health is that you believe what your mind's telling you, even if it doesn't fully make sense. And so it doesn't, so going into this film, even though it's pretty nuts, you kind of have to, kind of have to believe it. Uh, there's something I'm always curious about um, acting in genre films is it's difficult. Are you, are you often acting opposite something that isn't there? And if so, <laughs> oh. <laughs> How do you find the right tone mm -hmm. without going over the top? Or is that sort of up to the director to help you find that performance? And sometimes it's in the editing, I would think. So sure, how did you get yourself scared every day on the sweaty <laughs> set? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, on this project, thankfully we weren't doing a lot of work with uh, green tennis balls on sticks, you know, <laughs> running away from Tyrannosaurus Rexes and all of that. Um, and a lot of it was given to us. The location and art department did an excellent job on creating the house, which uh, for those who have seen it is a character in itself in the film. Um, the set pieces like the wallpaper falling off the wall, that was all practical. So much, more, so much of it was practical that we were able to sort of respond to what we were seeing in the moment, which made our jobs a lot easier. And then... Um, I think the only thing that we didn't necessarily have on the day, which I asked Remy about, was what the noises were that were haunting Bolt. Mm -hmm. Because if they were like taps, then you respond a certain way. Or if they're like voices, you respond a certain way. And just yeah. so I was like trying to mind the truth of uh, what he was going through in that moment. I think that was the only thing. And Remy shared some ideas with me, but then he was still like leaving it up in the air so that he had the freedom in the edit to do his yeah. masterwork, which he did. Yeah, I, I, sometimes I can feel your frustra frustration there because there are definitely things where it's <laughs> like, oh, I want to experiment in the edit. And you're like, don't <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Why am I hearing? <laughs> Something that I, I think is really interesting about the film is, is Wumi, your character uh, is kind of empathetic to understanding the, the witch's motivations. Um, we don't usually see characters trying to understand the monster in movies like this. Um, can you talk about uh, how you sort of explored the, that aspect of her personality? I think it's the, um, I feel like they're just this, they're quite opposite, right? He kind of, he wants to assimilate. She wants to go home. He's terrified of the and running away from the apeth, and she's kind of coming to it. So I, it it feels like a kind of yin and yang energy that they have. And you know, I don't know about I don't know if anyone believes in ghosts or anything. Or I'm terrified of <laughs> anything like that. But I I don't I try not to believe in it myself. But I, if I have a moment of like. I don't, know, I don't know, I feel something or something. I'm like, okay, you may be there, but I just don't want to interact with you. <laughs> so I still have that kind of interaction with my fear. Like I'm like, I, I acknowledge you, but I don't want, I don't want to go any further. <laughs> so I, there was something about that that I understood. I thought she was really brave to do that. And, but also it, there is the, um, well, actually it's kind of like, uh, it feels like Matt, like she's being worked on by the Apeth herself. So it's not so much like she's so like, I don't know if it's all part of the magic of, of, the, of the, the spell on the house that's actually drawing her to it and drawing her away from Baal. Um, so it, it feels kind of magnetic rather than like necessarily, I don't know, like 
that she's just like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't care about a pair. We're, we're best friends. <laughs> I don't think she's like that. I think it's more like a a, a draw. A, 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 um, she's being she's being manipulated herself as well. They just he just knows how to play both of them. Um, yeah, I think I think. I mean, since you brought it up and, and I'm very much like you in that I love horror films. I definitely believe in the supernatural, but I don't want to mess with it at all. I like watching the movies. Um, do the two of you, or are you someone who believes in spirits or ghosts? Are you talking to me? Yeah, uh, Remy and Shoppe. Oh, um, uh, I, it's not so much that I believe in ghosts, but more that I, I'm very excited by the fact that the world's just one big phenomenon. Phenomenon? Am I saying it right? Yeah. It's just like, um, you know, like existence is so surreal and bizarre that I'm, I find the more we try and create rules to try and understand it, the more of a, of a big mystery it all is. And I find that, I guess, sometimes terrifying, sometimes exciting and thrilling. And I think that's something I like to kind of do in my work is kind of open up reality and remind us that it's all strange and weird and a miracle and beautiful and scary and all of those things. And anything is possible. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Shape for you? I can't help but have this like dormant fear or expectation or awareness or sensitivity to its possibility. I think um, I think both Wumi and I come from very religious backgrounds. And I don't think if you're going to really engage with those, you can just accept the goodness of it. Mm. There is an antithesis to all of that. Now, whether that's like demons and demon demonology, demonic stuff, or if it manifests itself in um, male malevolent spirits, um, I'm not sure it's different for everyone. But I think one thing that human beings are excellent at doing is telling themselves stories and yeah. coming up with reasons why things happen and explaining yeah. phenomena throughout history. We've done it through our fiction or through our religious beliefs. Um, and I think that life is a bit more interesting when you don't dismiss those stories or you allow them to populate yeah. um, than if you just are really rational and scientific about everything and if there's no proof then it doesn't exist like what if you know mm -hmm. it's a bit more it's a bit more fun that way yeah I was yeah. just I was gonna use that exact word fun which is which is sort of twisted but it is fun <laughs> um, uh, you're shooting largely in this this the actual house the, the titular character in many ways. Um, did that provide some sort of unique challenges? Um, it feels very claustrophobic watching it. I don't know if that's what it was like mm -hmm. shooting it. Well, we actually had um, uh, two houses. We had the outside on the estate and then we had the inside. Um, so everything on the inside is on a sound studio. Is that right, a sound studio? Um, so as claustrophobic as it was, it still wasn't a big, space and it was to size we could take out walls right I can't remember now yeah. but did we take out walls we did didn't we, did. we? oh yeah ceilings. we did and ceilings and yeah yeah wow that's so creative um what did end up being the most challenging part of making the film either from an emotional standpoint a scene you had to do or something technical I would say technically um we're in it quite a lot you know, uh, it was quite a, <laughs> it was quite a relentless shoot for all of us, all three of us. Um, and I don't think I, before my career, that ever worked on anything where I didn't really get any rest days or a couple of days off a week. Like we were there every single day um, between. Shopper, you us. keep saying this. You you had one day <laughs> off. I had three. <laughs> okay, but you worked way off. harder than I did on the days that you were there. So it balances out. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think technically just that was an interesting, interesting thing to navigate whilst we were going. And also emotionally, it's really, really tiring to go through those really high emotions. So I think technically 
it was a feat that we achieved. Mm. Yeah. I, I would say like, for me, the scene I was most terrified was the drowning scene in the sea. First of all, I wasn't, I didn't, I had never been on a, on a, a, a on a lot with a with a tank so I thought we were going to be doing it in the sea so I was really scared <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I was really scared because like the idea of looking like you're drowning and struggling with clothes on and uh, and like 50 extras around you looking like they're struggling I thought I was going to panic and I did actually, even though it was a controlled environment, there were a couple of times where I'd be like, shut up, scared. <laughs> Just don't like the idea of like not being completely in control of my body or or, yeah. or people reaching out and holding on to me. I was just like, I can't do that. Um, so that was, uh, that was the thing I was most petrified about doing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you... Do you, all, all shop ever get like like that's obviously scary because it's very technical and like there's like almost stunty. But do you ever get nervous of like I don't know like any kind of showing certain emotions and stuff, or are you quite cool with any kind of performance? I um, it's interesting. Like I think there can be sometimes, especially early in one's career, a vanity in releasing into that truth. Um, like, oh, I don't like the way I cry. So I'm going to sort of skirt and avoid that a little bit. Um, but I think there was, a, there was a scene that I did in a film a long time ago that I really just released into and had no sort of awareness of how I looked or, and I, I really, really felt it. And that for me was a real turning point in my career because I was like, oh, this is what, the being feels like and it's got nothing you have no awareness of of what you look like from the outside because you're totally inside the character and I think that's something that I'll always try to strive for and try to strive for in this um in our project as well so maybe once upon a time there was a little reticence to go to certain places but I think that is the beauty of storytelling now. How do you feel about the Speaking a different language. <laughs> that I, I have nightmares whenever I'm asked to speak a different language. I'm asked to speak a different language a lot. And I still oh, really? get like panic n nightmares about them because you just have to, I don't know, like if you get it wrong, like I feel like you're really offending people. I feel like you're, you're yeah. representing, you're representing pe real people as much as they're like Real and Ball aren't real people they represent a lot of what people have gone through and our, and, uh, our community. And the idea of getting the Dinka wrong and people just being like, like the Dinka people, the Sydney's people like, this is so off, is mm -hmm. like, I don't know, you, you want to honor everyone that you portray, whether that person is fictional or, you know, not because they're still based in a truth. So yeah, I get real anxiety about that. <laughs> Remy, what about for you? Um, I know that this was made on an independent budget. I don't know how many shooting days you had, but you know, just just the logistics of everything you're trying to pull off. Uh, what was the biggest challenge for you? I think the same. What, shop, what shops were saying it was just the stamina, yeah. having to um, even like the pre-production. We had like six weeks, I think, maybe a bit more, maybe seven weeks pre-production, then the shoot, and just to be present every single day and be working, not just working on the day, but obviously thinking about the next days. And as a director, you know, you need to communicate as clearly as possible to a whole team of people. And so like, you, I don't think you're really allowed to be like, I'm shutting off today. <laughs> don't, talk to me. don't talk to me today because I'm pissed off. Like, like being like, just making sure that I'm always available when mm. people need me. I think that was, it was definitely a, a, a new muscle I had to, had to, you know, work out. I hope you all took long vacations when you wrapped this movie. Hopefully somewhere mm. nice and tropical. <laughs> well, we went to Morocco. We went to Morocco for the last week and that was wonderful. Yeah, to shoot the, um, 
Well, we were still working. You can say <laughs> we're still working, but we had the we had the day and we went to um we went to buy rugs. That was. Oh no! You forget how food poisoned I was, or water poisoned oh. I was that day. Do you uh. Remember? So that wasn't a rest day for me. That still felt like work. Oh, uh. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, that was bad. Yeah, that was. And it was just good. because I brushed my teeth in the hotel, right? Oh. And you like brushed oh, your no. teeth with bottled water, and I was just like, "Surely this will be fine." No, 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 no. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Recommendation to everyone watching: use bottled water. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I want to take some questions from the audience because we have a lot of really good ones. Uh, we have a question from Matt Brown. Um, horror is a genre where anything goes, but this story deals with some very serious, tragic, real-life situations. Was there any line you felt you couldn't cross in telling this story? I mean, there was, there was lines we couldn't. I didn't feel like I sh we should be able to cross. Um, uh, I wasn't interested in. Um, making a point of any of real life um, violence or gore or atrocities. I didn't want that. wasn't I wasn't interested in putting a spotlight on that. The horror for me had to be psychological. It had to be emotional, um, and I had to be honest as well. At to when. We were developing writing. It was based on so much research on real people's experiences, not just traveling um, to the UK, but living in the UK and having to live in this under similar um, conditions as the characters in the films, and how being stuck in a house and being not able to work and not able to really. Um, move on in the community can be really re-traumatizing for people and using that as the basis of the fear and the pain and not you know veering into I guess maybe just shock for shock's sake I think that's really important to me. Uh, we have another question from Zachary Kennedy. Uh, I want you to know he loves the film but also was curious about the process of working with uh, Rock Banos on the score. Um, I love the piece we hear as Wumi is uh, attacking the APEF and would love to hear about the approach to music in the film. Yeah, Roque Banos is a composer from Spain. And we talked very early on about wanting to take um, traditional Western horror score, but then mixing it with traditional um, East African score and seeing what happens when you when you clash them together. Um, and so he worked with um, African composers and musicians to record different sounds. And then he, because he's a musician himself, he recorded some stuff. And then we recorded um, some live instruments in um, uh, in, I forgot the name of the studio, where the Beatles was at. Abbey oh, Road. Abbey Road, Abbey Road yeah. Wow. That's the best mm -hmm. time of my life, going there. And we recorded there, and we, it, was, it, was, it was really fun watching him experiment and seeing what kind of new sounds we could create from like, mixing different cultures together. Shape uh, and Wumi, um... I always think it must be so interesting to work on a movie and then when you see it in its final form with the music, with you yeah. know all the special effects in place. Um, where did you first see the completed film and, and what was sort of your reaction? I was sent a screener of it to, to watch just a couple of days before we went out to see it at Sundance, oh. just so I knew what I was getting myself into. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, to one of the like real sort of moments where I realized that it's been so much so much more heightened by the music and the grading, etc., was to do with Rocky Banos as well. When um, Bol sets to work peeling the wallpaper after he's seen the hole in the wall disappear, that that like it was almost a bit like chanting, but really staccato and driving. I was just like, oh, this is wicked. I felt like I was like there working again. Um, <laughs> and I could feel almost like the 
adrenaline that was running through Ball in that moment, in that soundtrack. And I just, yeah, I definitely think Rocky Banjos has done an incredible job. Um, I watched it for the first time. I think, I want to say it was the so Warner Brothers lot. I don't know. So it's only lot, a lot in LA. Um, I don't know <laughs> if they have anything to do with the show. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was a little, cin- no, Par- maybe the Paramount lot, I think. Are you sure it was in 20th century? 20th century. <laughs> yeah, I think you're just like, you're, you're advertising yourself now. Yeah, right? just throwing out lots. <laughs> just in case oh, no, I have no, I have no idea. Future. I'm just, so, She's been I'm to just your lot. So, <laughs> I'm so bad at LA. I'm so bad at like LA. Um, um, yeah, okay. So what did you say it was? <laughs> I think it's the 20th century, right? Because uh, that's century what New lot. Regency was. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay, yeah, it was New Oh, that's when New Regency <laughs> Yes. Okay, I saw it in, with, at New Regency um, in Please their little um, uh, viewing room with my agent and manager and my next door neighbor who's like 75. I was a bit like, are you oh. sure you want to? <laughs> She's like, I really want to see it. <laughs> wow. And I was like, okay, well. Um, did she, she like it? She did really well. I jumped so much. I, I had to drink, have my drink, hand over my drink like this because I get done like <laughs> with a bird. <laughs> I was like my heart. Um, uh, so yeah, I was really, I was so proud because I, it's not, I don't normally watch my work and think like, um, oh, I, I, I see all the things that I, I did wrong. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I actually felt like, I could watch the film. I think because of the heart, my heart was pounding from the horror. And I just, I actually watched it. Like I didn't, I didn't just sit and critique everything. And that's really rare for me. And I don't really, I'm not saying like, oh, I smashed it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying like, <laughs> what, I really was like, my heart was pounding the whole way through. Um, and so I was, I was able to- woman. Oh, just, I was yeah. able to forget about judging myself because <laughs> I was just like, oh, you know, the whole way through, um, which is just rare. I can't, I actually was walked out of that thinking, I can't believe I actually watched that <laughs> rather than <laughs> critiqued it, <laughs> you know. Was it yeah. easier to film than watch? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not a horror fan. <laughs> And like the idea of like, but I always thought horror was just like blood guts and like people running after each other in a, in a mask or whatever. And I was still so moved by it. like that last image of all the people in the room actually mm. really hit me. And I just, and I'd almost forgotten about the horror in a way because it was, it was all about the emotion that it, it had drummed up in, uh, in me whilst watching it and just like it was when I read it um I, it felt really the feeling I had when I watched it is very similar to the feeling I had when I read it which is that never happens to yeah me. no uh we have a lot of people actually talking about that shot but also um a question from Matthew Goodhue uh wants to talk about the shot of Chape at the kitchen table that pulls back to reveal the water um he says it's the best shot I've seen in a long long time uh, was there a particular influence on the shot? How hard was it to achieve? And did you have to compromise on your vision of the shot at all? Um, a few questions there. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, it wasn't, it, I don't think I had to, I don't think we compromised on anything. Um, it was scripted that way. Um, it, I, I always like, there was always meant to be a transition from kitchen to a dream sequence. And I'm, I'm always the kind of person who is like, how do we do this but without all the bells and whistles and the fireworks? How do we make something feel really organic and unflashy? And I like the idea of just a gentle reveal as you push back and you think you're in one place and actually you are in another place. And I really enjoyed the idea of Ch- Chopin, um showing us his character just by him eating dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I, it, it felt really, um, just a really fascinating image I, I found really cool. Um, so yeah, I think 
Did that answer the question? Yeah, was, uh, the other part was, was it influenced by anything or? Mm. You know, I always like, I don't know whether it's influenced by anything specific, but like, I really enjoy f filmmakers like Kubrick or like Tarkovsky that makes um, quite, I guess, without sounding too like la -di -da, like poetic images and like finding ways to kind of stop for a moment just to breathe and just to have an image that just tells you something very visually um, just and, and, and then before going back into, I guess, the more action-y moments, so. Shopee, they were just saying such horrible things about you, so I'm glad. No, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm only here because I'm contractually obliged. If it was up to them, they would um, without me. <laughs> um, we actually have a question from, it's, it's an anonymous attendee. Uh, you sort of <laughs> asked the first part, you sort of already answered the first part of this question, which was when you sat down to write it, did you have the social aspect of the film in mind and look for a genre to place it in? Um, but the other part of the question is, do you think using art to illustrate is more powerful than preaching it? Oh. Yeah. Um, I think stories have a way of cutting through the noise. Um, I think that's what the that's what makes stories so powerful and I guess so dangerous as well, is that they can help they they can create something that's quite hard to understand, easily digestible and easily you can you put yourself into someone's shoes and you understand someone else. And I think that's always so much more successful than I guess, reading a PDF about a problem or a situation. Uh, it's, uh, oh, oh, sorry. No, I was no, just going to say, like, it's a, it's a mini experience, you know? It is not the experience, but rather than telling someone about something that happened or, like, or asking someone to go to the effort of reading, if you can present something to them, and especially in, in a cinematic way that helps you to feel it, through the music, through what you're seeing and what the characters that you're sharing time with are going through. Um, I think it just allows people to access in a way that you're able to switch off if you're being preached to. You're being invited in to share something as opposed to like sat down and made to listen to something or made to read something that you don't know about. Um, I think that fantasy and horror especially are incredible ways of dealing with real world issues and real world horrors in a way that doesn't feel like you're watching the news. But um, the amount of people who have responded to the film and been like, oh my God, the immigration system is terrible. Whereas if I asked them to read a Amnesty International report on it, they'd be like, yeah, but I'd rather not. This gives them the opportunity to be entertained and informed and educated and um, thrilled in the same 90 minutes. And I think a lot more people do just connect to storytelling in a fictional sense, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily, if it was, um, if you knew there was a, oh, what's the word? There are cause behind it. Mm. This isn't a film that's been made by Amnesty, but it shares a lot of information that Amnesty would want to disseminate to the world. So, um, not this is not an amnesty ad, by the way. <laughs> I promise I'm not being paid. Um, but yeah, I just think that films, stories, horror, fantasy give people more incentive to connect with things that they choose not to. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's um, the argument for diversity. Like, it, there's Oftentimes the argument for diversity is like, oh, I want to see myself on screen, which is a very valid reason for diversity. But I think what's a more powerful reason for it is when the, I remember growing up and then suddenly watching cinema from around the world and you watch whether it's Japanese or Korean or Austrian, you'd watch that cinema and you'd be like, oh, me too. Like, oh, too. they feel mm -hmm. exactly the same as I feel. Mm. And, and you suddenly realize that people who you've never met and you may never will meet, that they have all the same fears and 
hopes and dreams and anxieties as you do. And I think that's a very important thing you need to empathize with other people as well. Uh, it's such a fantastic film um, and it's on Netflix now so people can watch it over and over again. Um, I want to thank you again so much for being here. Congratulations on a beautiful movie and thank you so much everyone uh, at home for watching and joining us today. Thank you thank so much for Thank you. Fun. Bye, good everyone. to see you guys again. Yes, <laughs> good to see you. Miss you. <laughs>